찰리 앤더 초콜릿 팩토리 챕터 9 그랜파 조 텍스 갬블 The next day when Charlie came home from school and went to in to see his grandparents he found that only Grandpa Joe was awake The other three were all snoring loudly Shhh, whispered Grandpa Joe and he beckoned Charlie to come closer Charlie tiptoed over and stood beside the bed. The old man gave Charlie a sly grin and then he started rummaging under his pillow with one hand. And when his hand came out again, there was an ancient leather pulse clutched in the fingers. On the cover of the past clothes, the old man opened the Pulse and tipped it upside down. One feral single silver ten cent piece, which my secret told, he whispered. The others don't know I've got it. And now, when I are going to have one more fling of a fling at finding the last ticket, how about you? Eh? But you will have to help it. Are you sure? You want to spend your money on that, Grandpa? Charlie whispered. Of course, I'm sure. Splattered the old man excitedly. Don't stand there arguing. I'm just as crazy as you are to find that ticket. Here, take the money and run down the street to the nearest store and buy the first Wonka candy bar. You see, and bring it straight back to me. And we will open it together. Charlie took the little silver coin and slipped quickly out of the room. In five minutes, he was back. Have you got it? whispered Grandpa Joe, his eyes shining with excitement. Charlie nodded and held out the bar of candy, one cousin nut crunch surprise, he said on the wrapper. Good, the old man whispered, sitting up in the bed and rubbing his hand. Now, come over here and sit close to me. And we'll open it together. Are you ready? Yes, Charlie said. I'm ready. All right. You tear off the first bit. No, Charlie said. You fade for it. You do it all. The old man's fingers were trembling most terribly as they fumbled with a candy bar. You don't have a hope, really, he whispered, giggling a bit. You know, we don't have a hope, don't you? Yes, Charlie said, I know that. They looked at each other and both started giggling nervously. Mind you, said Grandpa Joe, there is just that tiny chance that it might be one. Don't you agree? Yes, Charlie said, of course. Why don't you open it, Grandpa? All in good time, my boy. All in good time. Which end do you think I ought to open first? That corner. The one furthest from you. Just tear off a tiny bit. But not quite enough for us to see everything. Like that, said the old man. Yes, now a little bit more. You finish it, said Grandpa Joe. I'm too nervous. No, Grandpa, you must do it yourself. Very well then. Here go, he tore off the wrapper. They both stared at what lay underneath. It was a bar of candy, nothing more. All at once, they both saw the funny side of the whole thing and they burst into fear of laughter. What the heck, going to? cried Grandma Josephine, walking up suddenly. Nothing, said Grandpa Joe. You go on back to sleep. Chapter 10 The family began to starve. During the next two weeks, the weather turns very cold. First came the snow, it began very suddenly one morning just as Charlie Bulky was getting dressed for school. Standing by the window, he saw the huge flags dripping slowly down out of an icy sky was the color of the steel. By evening, it lay four feet deep around the tiny house, and Mr. Bucky had to dig a fast from the front door to the road. After the snow, there came a freezing gale that blew for days and days without stopping. And oh, how bitter cold it was. 
everything that Charlie touched seemed to be made of ice. And each time he stepped outside the door, the wind was like a knife on his cheek. Inside the house, little jets of freezing air came rushing into through the side of the windows and under the doors. And there was no place to go to escape them. The four old ones lay silent and huddled in their bed, trying to keep the cold out of, the, of their bones. The excitement of the golden tickers uh, had long since been forgotten. Nobody in the family gave a sum now to anything except uh, to viral problem, to trying to keep warm and trying to get enough food to eat. There is something about very cold weather that gives one an enormous appetite. Most of us find ourselves beginning to crave rich cream, rich steaming stew, and hot apple pies, and all kinds of delicious warming dishes. And because we are all of a great deal luckier men that we realized we usually get what we want, or near enough. But Charlie Burke never got what he wanted because the family couldn't afford it. And as the cold weather went on and on, he became re ravenously and desperately hungry. Hungry. Both part of Candy's birthday one and the one Grandpa Joe had bought had long since, since been nibbled away. And all he got now were those thin cabbage meals three times a day. Then all at once the meal became even thinner. The reason for this was that the uh, space factory, the place where Mr. Bucky worked, suddenly went bust and had to close down. Quickly, Mr. Vulcan tried to get another shop, but he had no luck. In the end, the only way in which he managed to earn a few pennies was by shoveling snow in the street. But it wasn't enough to buy even a quarter of the food and seven people needed. The situation became desperate. Bucket was a single slice of bread for each person now, and lunch was maybe half a boiled potato. Slowly but surely, everybody in the house began to starve. And every day, little Charlie Bucky, trudging through the snow on his way to school, would have to pass Mr. Willy Wonka's giant chocolate factory. And every day, as he came here near to it, he would lift his smell point nose high in the air and sniff the wonderful sweet smell of melting chocolate. Sometimes she would stand motionless outside the gate for several minutes on end, take deep swallowing breaths as though she were trying to eat the small itself. The child, said Grandpa Joe, poking his hip up from under the blanket on one ice morning, the child had got to have more food. It doesn't matter about us. You are too old to bother him. But a growing boy, he can't go on like this. He's beginning to look like a skeleton. What can one do? murmured Grandma Josephine miserably. He refused to take any of ours. I hear his mother try to slip his one piece of bread on his plate at breakfast this morning, but he wouldn't touch it. He made her take it back. He's a fine little boy fellow, said Grandpa George. He deserves a little, he deserves a better than this. The cruel weather went one and one, and every day Charlie Burke grew thinner and thinner. His face became frighteningly white and pinched. The skin was drawn tightly over the cheeks, then you could see the shape of the bones underneath. It seemed doubtful whether he could go on much longer like this without becoming dangerous will. And now very calmly, with that curious wisdom that seemed to come so often to small children in times of hardship, he 
he began to make little changes here and there in some of the things that he did, so as to save his strength. In the mornings, he left the house ten minutes earlier so that he could walk slowly to school without ever having to run. He sat quietly in the classroom during recess, resting himself, while the others rushing outdoors and threw snowballs and wrestled in the snow. Everything he did now, he did slowly and carefully to prevent exhaustion. Then one afternoon, walking back home with icy wind in his face and incidentally feeling hungrier than he had ever felt before. His eye was caught suddenly by a piece of paper that was lying in the gutter in the snow. The paper was a greenish color, and there was something vaguely familiar about it. Charlie stepped off the curb and bent down to examine it. Part of it was buried under the snow, but he saw once what it was. It was a dollar bill. Quickly he looked around him. Had somebody just dropped it? No, that was impossible because of the way part of it was varied. Several people went hurrying past him on the sidewalk, their chins sunk deep in the colors on their coat, their feet crunching in the snow. None of them was searching for any money. None of them was uh, taking the slightest notice of the small boy crouching in the gutter. Then, was it his? This dollar? Could he have it? Carefully, Charles pulled it out from under the snow. It was damp and dirty, but otherwise perfect. A whole dollar. He held it tightly between his shivering fingers, gazing down at it. It means one thing to him at that moment. Only one thing. It means food. Automatically, Charlie turned and began moving toward the nearest shop. It was only ten paces away. It was newspaper and stationery store, the kind that sells almost everything, including candy and cigar and what he would do. He whispered quickly to himself. He would buy one luscious, luscious bar of candy and eat all of it. Every bit of it, right then and there, and the rest of the money he would take straight back home and give to his mother.